Hello and welcome to the Ask Echo Meter weekly training sessions. Today's session is titled Introduction to Plunger Lift and will be presented by Lynn Rowland. During Lynn's 40 years in the oil and gas industry, he's received several awards for his work. He's authored more than 80 research and technical papers, co-authored a book on gas well deliquefaction, and he holds a patent on plunger lift analysis. He's given hundreds of seminars and talks on efficient operation, optimization, and troubleshooting oil and gas wells. And we're so glad he's presenting today. So Lynn, I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, good afternoon, or in fact, uh, good morning, depending on where you're, call where, you're, where you're logging in from. So this is kind of fun to have people from all over the world on this presentation. Um, the class, this, this, this is going to be about an hour talk. It's on uh, plunger lift, um, echometer, uh, began developing this technology a little bit after 2000, almost 20 years ago. And um, it took us a little bit to, to come up with a software program. May 18th, 2005, we had our first uh, plunger lift software program and first class on analyzing wells with uh, acoustic data on plunger lift. So, so this is, this is um, uh, if you're familiar with TWM, that was what we used at first, and now we've migrated the, the calculations and, and software uh, analysis into a program called TAM. You can download uh, the TAM software from our webpage. Uh, you can use that for no charge to import your TWM data. If you track a plunger and analyze it in the TAM software, it has it has some additional features that that make the analysis easier and better in my in my view. Uh, I've listed several several articles here, several papers that we've written. Uh, those papers are available. Uh, they'll likely be on a link uh, on our webpage. Um, so that'll be uh, once you download or go to the webpage, the uh, Ask Equimeter webpage, you should be able to access these papers or they may just be on our technical paper web page. Uh, pl plunger lift is a is a method that's used to typically deliquefy gas wells and it's um, probably the, 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 the most economical lift method because the, the cost to set the equipment up is low cost the cost to maintain the equipment is, is low uh, you don't have to use a rig to install it typically, um, and the deeper the well is, the the deeper the casing for a conventional well. The more casing angular volume you have, which means you have more energy. So it's not it's not really uh, more cost versus depth. You just limit your number of trips because it takes more time for the plunger to travel. Uh, the the plunger the system for for a conventional well uses the the energy from the well, and so the the cost for Operating cost for energy is it can be zero if there's no additional gas that's been is, is added. Uh, the probably the, the biggest disadvantage of conventional plunger lift is that you have to shut the well in, let the plunger fall to the bottom, and let the pressure build up so it'll come back for the next cycle. Uh, the plunger lift typically conventional plunger lift is is uh, gassy wells and to get the liquid out of the tubing. Uh, you can sweep the tubing and remove any uh, deposits. Uh, but often you don't have a high liquid rate, so it's a it's a lower liquid rate produce, producing method, but uh, it 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 lacks gas. So um, and there's kind of an argument if you can which method can get the pressure the lowest. And someone would say, well, you can run a, a beam pump and pump the well off, but if you don't put the pump at the bottom of the purse, then the plunger lift can probably even do better than beam lift. So beam lift doesn't always have the have the lowest pressure. It depends really where the pump pump set depth is compared to the end of the tubing. Now, probably the first thing you do when you go to a plunger lift well, if you're going to track the plunger, and we'll talk about how that all works, is you're going to shoot down the casing and then shoot down the tubing and see what you see. And what I mean by that is if the well's having, a, having problems and you're wanting to troubleshoot that well, 
then this acoustic trace here shows that there's an obstruction, some kind of obstruction in the tubing, and the liquid level has been pushed out of the tubing, and the tubing is dry, and you can see upkick there and a downkick at this obstruction. This obstruction is, a, is a, a, a something in the well. You're not sure what it is, but it's going to it's going to maybe block the plunger as the plunger falls down the well, and you'll see that by shooting a fluid level, and then you'll have a, some expectation of what to see when you track the plunger. Now this is another uh, plunger lift well, and the plunger was a, was coming to the surface only about 20% of the time, and so the operator caught the plunger and shut the well in overnight. He came back in the morning, he shot the fluid level, and he could see the up kick at the hole in the tubing, and a down kick liquid still in the tubing uh, above the tubing. So he could see what's wrong in both of these fluid level shots, uh, and it, it helps you understand what to expect and how to how to potentially what kind of look for in, when you're shooting and tracking a plunger. You can they help each other analyze the well. Uh, this just shows some of the basic components of a plunger lift system. You know the the controller is the computer that operates the system, and it's a uh, it, it may be simple, it may be comp complex, and the the motor valve is opened or closed by the con the controller. And the controller is using some settings to decide when the well is turned off or shut in, and the plunger falls to the bottom, or when the motor valve is open, the well is on, and the gas and the plunger and liquid are brought to the surface, or held to the surface in afterflow. Then at the, at the surface, there's a lubricator, and it's designed to catch the plunger. It has a spring in it. But it's important, even if you have a spring in the lubricator, you're going to often, you don't want to run the plunger dry, it's going to cause damage. So it's important to always have a little bit of liquid above the plunger, and you want the plunger to hit the bumper spring on the bottom and have liquid there so it doesn't cause mechanical impact and potential damage. Now, the rival sensor is typically right here, and it'll detect the rival of the plunger, and there's different types of sensors that you can have and different types of transducers you can have to measure pressures and arrival velocities, arrival of the plunger, and all those are used to as input into the controller to operate the well. The plunger is a mechanical seal, and it, is, it seals the liquid above the plunger and the, the high pressure gas that drives the plunger to the surface below the plunger. And so again, it's a very simple, a very simple system. Um, it's low cost and it's typically efficient. Now this is a list of components, and this is a this is a components that are used to set up a plunger lift installation, and this is actually what's used by a company. And if you go through this list of components, most of the components, other than the bumper spring, the plunger, the controller, the motor valve, and the lubricator, the rest of it's just pipes and valves. It's pretty simple, pretty simple to set up. And so you you know it's not it's not a heavy piece of equipment you have to move on site. It mainly just needs to be assembled and and then you can set the bumper spring uh, and drop the plunger and follow the plunger down to the bumper spring and see it come back up. Uh, this is the echo meter equipment, the, the wired equipment on a well and uh, we can use both the wired and wireless equipment now to track a plunger and this is a fairly old pi picture of the, of, the, of the gas gun on the lubricator and I like to show this picture because when we first started tracking the plunger we'd attach the gas gun directly to the lubricator and we have to close the master valve to uh, bleed this pressure off so we could attach the gun and that would take some time and, and often it would extend the shut-in time and that would cause the plunger to have extra casing pressure and the plunger would come up somewhat dry, often dry and too fast when we first started doing this and I'd wonder why would the operator operate the plunger like that until I realized it wasn't the operator, it was me, the way I was installing the gun. So we started from then on saying, well, from now on, you need to put a full, full opening valve on the well and the lubricator so that you can sneak up on the well. Well, you can't sneak up on the well, but sneak up on the well and attach the gas gun to the well without your, you even the well even knowing you're there, and then you can open the valve and start acquiring the data without disturbing the normal operating conditions of the well. So this is this is how we recommend the upper left hand corner picture is how we recommend attaching a gas gun to the well now 
we recommend always using a fully opening, typically a half inch valve, uh, so that we can have it closed and then attach the gun and then open and start acquiring data. And that's that's really the best the best method. And we like the valve the gun to be vertical, so any liquid that unloads, it runs in and it runs right back out. It doesn't it doesn't fill the gun up with uh, liquid like it would here if it was just laying on its side. Now, when you collect data on a well with an echometer system, there's a paper that we wrote in 2000 called Total Well, Ma Total well Management. And part of that paper said, here's the questions you should answer when you use equipment to collect data on a well. And so for plunger lift, you can see your questions are, where's the plunger? Is that the surface or in the liquid or on the bottom? And, and you can see that. You can see when the plunger hits a liquid, and that basically a gassy fluid column hits that gassy fluid column. You can see when the plunger hits it. You can see the pressure based on the casing pressure calculated down at the end of the tubing. And you can see the potential shut-in pressure based on analyzing a conventional cycle. Uh, we can see the liquid above the end of the casing on the above the end of the tubing in the casing annulus. Uh, we monitor the tubing and casing pressures throughout a cycle, and that provides a lot of different information that we'll, we will talk about. Uh, we can see that the, if the well needs a standing valve, because during shut-in, if the liquid load in the tubing gets pushed out, you, you need a standing valve to keep that from happening. Um, and that usually occurs when the tubing set too high and you just uh, don't have any pressure from the well to hold the liquid in. We calculate the maximum production rate available from the well. Uh, we use the casing pressure, the tubing pressure, the casing size, tubing size, and the liquid in the tubing to calculate how much gas is stored in the casing annulus, stored in the tubing, flows in from the formation, and flows down the sales line. And that's, that's kind of a novel thing that we do. The plunger, when it falls down the well, it not only tells you where it is, what, what color it just went by, it tells you the distance based on the average joint length of the tubing, and it give, you can, we time it so we know the velocity of the plunger. And then we know also, based on the acoustic velocity of the plunger falling the well, we know the, the, the gas gravity. So we know pressure, temperature, and acoustic velocity. So we can calculate the gas gravity of the gas in the well. And when there is a restriction, like a down kick, that reduces a cross-section of the tubing, uh, that's likely to stop the plunger and we can see when the plunger stops so that we'll see those we'll see all those kind of things we talk about the data now this is a, a typical uh, plunger lift conventional well cycle and it's one of the examples called plunger normal cycle and so here we shut the well in and you can see the green is the acoustic signal uh, the pressure signal for the tubing and the blue is the casing pressure signal in blue. And when we shut the well in, the casing pressure and tubing pressure are building up. And in the background, this dark black signal here is the acoustic signal. And so the, the pressure is building up because pressure gas volume is flowing into the tubing. And the plunger is falling. This is noise of the plunger falling down the well. And when the plunger hits the liquid, we see a signal change right there where it's liquid. And then we see another signal change right there. It gets, usually gets quieter. It may get noisier when the plunger is the bottom, depend on, depends on the well. And then we see the end of the shut-in time period when, this, when the valve, motor valve opens. We see the acoustic signal when the plunger unloads, the tube drops the line pressure and brings liquid to the surface. We see this noise here that is the liquid rushing by, the gassy fluid rushing by the microphone. We see the pressure response of the tubing as that casing pressure gets closer and closer to the surface as it unloads the liquid and the plunger to the surface in the well. And then this piece right here is the afterflow. Once the plunger rises to the surface, surface, the plunger is held to the surface and the well uh, continues to flow. Now, the motor valve, this is the motor valve and it's controlled by the computer, the controller on the well. And so it's really the switch. It's the on and off switch for the well for a conventional plunger and when the controller says shut, then this valve closes and no more flow goes down the sales line. And the pressure in the well starts to build, both in the tubing and the casing. And the plunger during this off time is, is falling down the tubing. 
And then when the controller sees a certain set of conditions based on the control algorithms that are set in the controller, then the motor valve is opened by the controller and the well is on, like an on and off switch. And then the gas, liquid is unloaded from the tubing and gas is uh, uh, surging out of the casing in the tubing and, and the well uh, unloads the liquid and, and then holds the pressure at the surface when the, the plunger at the surface when uh, the plunger arrives. Now the controllers, there's all kinds of controllers and the simplest one is typically time. And a lot of times when you use, uh, a lot of times time, when you use a manual on and off timer, the operator often is concerned the plunger comes up. And often he'll say something like, if my cl plunger comes up, that's good enough. Um, and what that means, though, is that means that often the well's not optimized. So when I see a well that's on uh, a manual timer, plunger with well on manual timer, I often think that it's it's probably not optimized and, and more gas could likely be produced from that well. The next type of automation here is, is called based on plunger velocity and it needs a good arrival sensor to see the, the arrival of the plunger and that then you can adjust the arrival speed by changing the amount of afterflow more or less afterflow can, can regulate the, the rise velocity of the plunger and then there's combination type controllers that are more complicated and you know the main thing the controller purpose is, is it should help you maximize your production out of the well. Now when I talk about plunger lift cycle, I'm, I'm thinking about the it divide, a conventional plunger cycle is divided in three parts. The well is shut in by the controller shutting the motor valve and it's shut in for a sufficient time so that the plunger can fall from the surface all the way to the bottom to the bumper spring. And during that time, we want the casing pressure to build to a pressure that's high enough to bring the plunger and accumulate liquid back to the surface. So that's what I call the shut-in time. And in fact, that's the first time it's defined to me by, by Dan Phillips. I've, I've stuck with that definition. Um, unloading means that the, some criteria has been, been met in the controller time or pressure or uh, something, maybe whatever the conditions are met, the motor valve opens and the casing pressure starts to drop and the tubing pressure drops and that uh, stored energy in the casing results in lifting the plunger and accumulated liquid to the surface. Um, once the plunger arrived, we're in afterflow and we're selling gas down the sales line and the plunger is typically held at the surface by, by, by pressure. And so that's the, the three parts of a plunger lift cycle. Now this is just a little simple diagram that shows the plunger lift well and the plunger in the well. Here we're shut in, the plunger's fall on the bottom, it falls through the gas, it falls to the liquid, it rests at the bottom. Once it's at the bottom, um, the casing pressure is increasing to a point where you're ready to bring it back up. And when those conditions are met, then the motor valve opens based on the controller. Um, and the plunger with the pressure from the casing is driven to the surface and the plunger then is held at the surface once it arrives with pressure and then we're in the afterflow time period and then the cycle repeats. Now this is this is the same data we looked at a minute ago. It's called the normal plunger cycle and we've labeled here the casing pressure we called it CP and the tubing pressure called TP and the line pressure called LP and that those are just abbreviations for LP for line pressure, TP for tubing pressure and CP for casing pressure. And when you open the valve to bring the plunger up, a rule of thumb is called the load factor. And the load factor is the ratio of this distance here, which is casing minus tubing, compared to this overall distance called the casing minus line, which is the lift, ener the lift energy. And so this distance here sh should normally, by rule of thumb, be less than half this distance. And so if you look at your casing and your tubing pressure uh, plot at the end of shut-in and you look at your uh, distance to your casing minus line pressure and this distance here is, is more than half the distance then usually the plunger won't come up. You usually have to have, have to have a smaller a smaller distance, a smaller liquid load. So this is this is, this well has has uh, a, a, a liquid load probably around 20 percent 
and the plunger will come up. So if we open the valve here, the plunger comes up. And sure enough, it, it came up in this well. And load factor is just a, a method that you could use for control if you wanted. Um, this just talks about what we just said. The, the casing pressure what, is what builds up during shut-in. And you may even need to build extra time to, to have enough pressure to bring the plunger up. Uh, there's a paper that we wrote called Foss and Gall that calculates the rise velocity based on a certain casing pressure. And that's available, uh, papers on, a, on our web page. Uh, and loading us here is talking about when you open the well up, the tubing pressure drops the line pressure, and that creates that differential pressure. And then the casing pressure minus tubing pressure is the liquid load. And that uh, casing minus line is the energy that lifts the plunger to the surface. And so these these are these are these pressures are something that we need to consider when we operate the plunger lift well. Now this is the example inside the the TAM software where the motor valve is 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 open. Right here, the motor valve is open and the motor valve is closed right here. So this is our shut-in time period. And this is unloading and then afterflow. And so during this time when the valve is closed, uh, there's no sales. The plungers fall on the bottom. And the casing pressure is limit, building up to some, some, some limit. And this data has been captured uh, by the, the TAM software or the TDMM software. And this is the analysis tab inside the uh, TAM software to, to, define a, to define a cycle. And so here we have A, which is where the valve closes and shut-in begins. Point B, this dash line right here, is when the valve opens and unloading begins. And this is where the valve closes and the next cycle begins right here. And these are the, these are the actual clock times of those events. And we can click on this word clock and change that to minutes, seconds, hours, um, or clock time. So all the, there's different ways to show this data. And we, we, you choose which way you want to show the data and make your reports and, and, and things like that. Now this is the unloading portion of the cycle. And so here we have uh, the motor valve opens right here at B. And then the, the tubing pressure drops to line pressure, line pressure right here. And at this point, the line pressure would be when the liquid starts to arrive. Right here, it says the liquid starts to arrive at a line, a tubing pressure of 126 psi. And the casing pressure right here is has dropped down to about 235 psi. So that's a drop from about 258, no, it looks higher than that, to about almost 300 psi, down to about 258. Uh, that's when the liquid starts being brought to surface and all this noise here, uh, that's noise, it's the black noise is a liquid going by the microphone of the gas gun attached to the lubricator and we're hearing this, we're recording these signals at the surface of the well. Um, here's the tubing pressure increasing and the plunger arrives right there at that little spike. Typically, almost always, it's just a little spike in pressure. When the plunger arrives, the casing pressure sort of flattens out right there. And this is the liquid unloading at the surface. And once the liquid unloads, the plunger is then held at the surface. And after flow, and after a period of time of uh, after flow, then the, then the cycle repeats. Um, I think we just said all that, so I'll skip on the next slide. Now this 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 well right here is the plunger uh, well three cycles from static and so what we're saying here is there's one two three cycles and here we're shut in and the casing pressure is 600 psi and the tubing pressure is 500 psi and for you know people all all over the world that are not U.S. units you can you can modify the display units to any, any system units that you wish. You just have to go into the settings and say metric or whatever systems you want to you want to choose. And if you click on the on the heading here, you can change that heading of the graph and the units right here on the screen. You can click on that and change it. Uh, notice here that lapse time is in minutes. Uh, so the tubing pressure minus the casing pressure, casing pressure minus tubing, 100 PSI. 100 PSI uh, in two and three inch tubing is about at 250 feet of, of gas-free liquid, um, and it's about it's about uh, 100 psi, 250 feet. Now, that's a rule of thumb. It's approximate. I use those numbers because they're easy for me to remember. 
So I think about a barrel, it's 100 foot, 250 foot tall, 100 psi. So we just got a barrel liquid right there. Now, right there at point A, we, we manually open the well up and we start dropping the pressure and the, the, the plunger and liquid start to arrive and we start seeing this unloading of the liquid. And there's a, a, lot of, a lot of time goes by here, a lot of liquid's being brought to the surface. And then right there, the plunger arrives and immediately we shut the well in because we're just trying to swab that liquid out and drop the plunger. And so here's the plunger falling back through the gas. Here's falling through the liquid and then right back up there it's on the bottom. And then we open it back up. And notice now this time that there's less time here, less liquid. And then as soon as the plunger arrives we shut it back in another cycle. And then the liquid's less and now we're ready to turn the well onto the controller and let it continue to operate. So these three cycles show quite a few things. We'll look at this in a little more, more detail. Uh, so here's here's a, an annotated uh, plunger normal cycle uh, unloading and, and after flow events. The casing pressure drops when you start unloading. The tubing pressure drops. The pressure drops down to line pressure. Uh, when the plunger starts, liquid starts to arrive, the tubing pressure goes up. The plunger typically arrives at the peak pressure. Uh, the noise of the microphone increases significantly when the liquid goes by the microphone. Uh, once you see this, this spike, almost always the tubing pressure starts to drop in case he starts, the pressure starts to drop in, in afterflow. So this is a, a normal behavior of a conventional plunger lift well in unloading and afterflow with the data that you'd collect, let's say at high speed, at 30 samples of se per second or, or faster. And so usually on a padded plunger, you'll, you'll, you'll collect data at 30 samples a second. Maybe a solid plunger, you'll collect data at 60 sam samples a second because it's faster. And then at a bypass plunger uh, or two-piece plunger, you may even go up to 480 samples a second to be able to uh, see the plunger fall on so very, very fast. Uh, so, being able to see the plunger, it kind of takes your guess time out of the time. It takes your guesswork out of the time to set the time for shut-in. Uh, you can typically see the plunger fall uh, to the liquid and then rest on the bumper spring. Probably 60% of the time you can see it hit the bottom and see it bounce on the, the pressure transfer to the bumper spring. Uh, you'll ma have maximize your gas production from your well if you have the minimum shut-in time required to get the plunger to the bottom. Uh, we won't talk about Fossengall in this presentation, but we will talk about that in a future presentation. Uh, you can use the Fossengall model to set the, the uh, shut-in time to bring the plunger up at a certain rise velocity, and that's, that's uh, available in an Excel spreadsheet. If you're interested in that, you can email us and we'll send that spreadsheet to you. Uh, plus, you'll uh, save, save some time by making sure your plunger runs are made and, you, and you'll maximize your sales. Now this is the example of the second cycle that we saw. Let me go back just for a second. If we're looking right here where the well is shut in, this is what we're looking at. And, and we're gonna, this data is acquired at 30 samples a second and it's 130 minutes of, of elapsed time. So I'm gonna zoom in and look at this piece from this time to that time for more detail. And so that's what this slide shows right here. And so when you look at more detail at this slide, you can see that these little spikes here are fairly uniformly spaced, and those little spikes is the plunger falling through the gas in the well, and we can hear the plunger falling by each of the tubing collar recesses in this EUE tubing. And we calculate the average fall velocity through the gas for this dual pad plunger is 201 feet per minute. And the plunger is falling through the gas, and it hits the liquid right there. And then maybe 10% of the time you can see it fall past every collar below the liquid level. So here we're seeing it fall, especially when the pressure's high. When the pressure's high, the signal carries well, and so the pressure is fairly high here. That's 400 psi pressure on the tubing, and so it conducts the signal very well. And so here we can see the plunger falling past each of the uh, tubing collar recesses in liquid. And then we can see it hit bottom right there. Um, and there's some other things we can see that we'll talk about later. But the, the fall velocity through liquid in this case was about 40 feet per minute. And that's a pretty, pretty, pretty good number. Most of the time, 
when you think about how fast the, the conventional plungers fall, when there's a seal, the plungers typically fall around 40 feet per minute through liquid. And that's what you should expect to see when you're tracking a plunger. If there's a bypass that opens up and lets the plunger fall faster, it'll fall a little bit faster through the, the gassy fluid. Now, if we take this data and we zoom in even to a deeper, a, a closer detail to one minute of time, I know we're looking at one minute of time, and this is a normal plunger, plunger cycle, and we're looking at the time from 41 minutes of time to 42 minutes of time. Um, and what we're seeing here is that this spike right here is the spike of the plunger going by the 207th joint from, that's the acoustic signal, of the plunger going by the 207th joint in the well. And down here is the table that shows the that information. That's the time to that joint. That's the fall velocity from the over this time right here. And then that's the depth of that joint. And here's the average fall velocity in this well. And that's the fall velocity we, we, we calculate through liquid. And so this little graph shows all these different uh, measured plunger fall velocities versus time. It shows the fall depth through, there's depth here, depth through here to the gas and then depth through liquid. And it shows the plunger at liquid at that depth and the plungers on bottom at that point in time right there. And if we click on this, this arrow here, it's gonna, it, it'll expand this graph and we can see it in more detail. So, so how, do we get the, how do we get the fall velocity? Well, it, it's really just as simple as saying, here is the time at this caller echo, and here's another time at this caller echo. So this is 5.663 minutes and 5.802 minutes, and this is the elapsed time if you just take the difference. And you know the average joint length, so you can calculate the distance is average joint length divided by the change in time, and that gives us the fall velocity through joint 21 through 22 col collar, and there's our our average fall velocity. So, so this is a this is a a, a, a view of of one minute, and this is what we're looking at right here one minute, and we can we can even make it a smaller interval if the plunger is falling faster. So we may even need to make this interval more than one minute. And here it shows what minute we're looking at, or the time interval we're looking at right there. And this is the total time right here that it falls through gas. So this is the time through gas, and that's the portion of the time you're looking at where it fell through one minute, one minute of time through the gas. Now we click on that button right there, and that button pops up this screen, and this screen is the plunger fall velocity versus depth. And um, you can see that it starts out fast, the fa and fast is, is more negative falling down, minus means fall, falling down, and more slow means that it's less negative, so it's falling down 140 feet per minute right here, and it's falling at 240 feet per minute right here. And so for, for a normal plunger well, that there's no hole in the tubing, and the casing's building up during shut-in, then the plunger tends to slow down over time. And so this is the plunger slowing down over time. And so that's that's normal. And we were able to monitor this and monitor it, the plunger fall in the well. And at first I thought, well, that's just normal. And then I realized that it's not normal. It's just a function of how fast the gas flows in the well and how fast the pressure builds up. And we've developed, we wrote a paper on that. And that's one of the papers that's cited at the, the front of the the SV paper site at the front of the document, the front of this presentation, where we have a model that calculates the fall velocity as a function of this inverse square root of the density of the gas. So as the gas pressure goes up, the density increases, and then the velocity changes inversely proportional to the square root of the gas density. So that's that's this relationship. Um, so here's the depth scale. Here's the velocity scale, you can click on any point and it shows that point up on the top and it rotates the table back to that point. So if you click on that point, if you were to go back to this table, you'd be at, at, on that point on the, on the, in the table. This just shows the shut-in time period and what we see here is that when you shut the well in, the, the casing pressure is building, the tubing pressure is building. We typically see these uniformly spaced uh, collar echoes that we can count. Uh, when it hits the liquid, the signal changes. Now, I used to say it get, got noisier, and this 
Well, here it got noisier when it hit the liquid. And the reason why it got noisier is because the casing pressure is, the tubing pressure is building up because the gas is flowing in the tubing. And once the plunger falls, when the plunger is falling through the gas, you can't hear the gas bubbling through the liquid at the bottom of the tubing. And once the plunger hits the gas, gassy fluid, and the plunger is below the liquid level in the tubing, then you hear the gas bubbling out of the liquid and you can and it gets noisier. But if the tubing pressure is flat, that means no gas is flowing in the tubing. And when the plunger hits the liquid, it gets quieter. So it it, it and then the plunger is on the very bottom, right to there. You can see it got there, it gets quieter. So there's some things you can see about this cycle you try to analyze as well. Now I'm going to zoom in to, to five minutes of time. So here I'm not marking off five minutes of time along the shut-in time period of the entire shut-in time period for this well. And now this is what we see when we zoom in to, to um, five minutes of elapsed time. We can see something that we may not have expected. Right here, the motor valve, the motor valve closed. And it took a short time for the pressure to build up. And once the pressure built up equal to the way the plunger divided by its area, which is about 3 psi, then the plunger falls out of the lubricator right there. The plunger falls out of the lubricator, and that's when it starts to fall. But really, shut in began right there when the motor valve closed the valve. And see, notice how it got quiet here. It gets quiet when the motor valve closes. And you can see the signal on the acoustic trace, the change in pressure when the plunger goes by a collar. You see the change in pressure on the pressure trace also. So you can see the plunger falling both on the uh, acoustic signal, the change in pressure signal, or the pressure signal if you have a high resolution, uh, high speed sampling pressure transducer. So that's what we have here. And you can see both the uniformly spaced collars on the tubing pressure typically signal and the acoustic signal. Now, if we zoom in a little bit more and look at more detail, um, here we're looking at, th at the plunger cycle that says three cycles from static. We're looking at the time interval from uh, 95 minutes to 96 minutes about. And this is just one uh, falling through one um, one joint. Now this is this is 3,500 feet from the surface, and that's the 112th co collar. And this is the tubing, This is the pressure recorded at the surface. So if I blow like that to my microphone, you can. That's what you feel is a two psi pressure wave. Not very much. You don't feel that at all. Oh, you can't blow through a microphone. Anyway, there's not, this, is, this is a small amount of pressure. So you have to have a very sensitive pressure sensor to be able to see this. And this, this allows us to track the plunger and see the plunger falling deep in a well when we see these little pressure changes or the little changes in the acoustic signal. And that allows us to determine the position of the plunger, the fall velocity of the plunger, and then we can calculate the velocity of the plunger as it's falling down the well. Uh, this is another thing that's that's that you see here. This is the same. This is the same uh, well plunger three cycles from static that we can look at later when we start looking at the data. But often when the plunger rests on bottom, you see a little pressure hop in the tubing pressure data, and that means the way that the plunger transferred off of the gassy fluid onto the bumper spring, and that's a little hop. And so that you see that about maybe half the time. So it, it depends. Depends on the well. You almost always see the plunger falling through the gas, and you see the collar spikes. Um, sometimes, sometimes you see the plunger uh, hit the bottom and see a, a repeat echo of the of the plunger hitting the bumper spring of the casing. That's a repeat echo from the bumper spring to the surface of the casing, and and sometimes you see this little pressure hop to identify when the plunger's on bottom. So this is on bottom. This is on bottom. And we can zoom in and see that based on uh, the data that we collect on the well. Uh, this is another plot here of, I don't remember which well this is. I didn't put the name of the well. But you can see that it says plunger hole, it says pl plunger hole in, in tubing deep. So there's the name of the, this example well. And what I'm wanting to show you is that when the plunger goes by collar 63 and makes this pressure wave, this, this, this acoustic signal, then the pressure wave leaves the plunger and comes to the lubricator and hits the microphone. It doesn't disappear at the microphone. It bounces off the surface and travels back down, hits the top of the plunger, 
And this is a repeat echo of the plunger going down the well. And this is a repeat again. And so this is this is a round trip travel time to the depth of the plunger at caller 63. And we use that round trip travel time along with the depth to calculate the acoustic velocity. And there's our acoustic velocity for this example right here. This is it right here for echo 65. And based on that round trip travel time, then we can calculate the gas gravity of the gas in the tubing. So this is the plunger's measuring the gas gravity of the gas in the tubing based on the acoustic velocity. And it does a weighted average of all the collars you pick and comes up with a weighted average of the, of the collar echoes that you pick. Echo, echo, there's an echo, there's an echo, the collar, there's an echo. When you pick those, it, it summarizes them, does an average to determine the average acoustic velocity and then the gas gravity, the gas in the tubing that you're producing as well. So what else can you do? Well, you can find holes because the plunger has a certain weight. It's about 2 to 3 psi, which is the way the plunger divided by the area. So that's its, it's weight is converted into a pressure. And when you drop the plunger from the lubricator past the pressure sensor, the pressure sensor sees the weight of the plunger falling through the gas. And the pressure below the, the plunger increases by 2 to 3 psi as it's falling in the tubing. And if there's a hole down in the well in the tubing, that 2 to 3 psi pressure will push gas out through that hole and equalize the pressure at the hole because of extra weight from the plunger. And then once the plunger goes by the hole, then we'll see that pressure uh, increase and we'll be able to identify the depth to a hole. Or if it sticks, we can see the plunger behave, uh, see it stop. And so this is the pressure we're talking about. So here's, here is the plunger and we divide it by the area and that in this case for this particular plunger is about 2.4 psi and then here's that pressure drop when it falls out of the lubricator that's a pressure drop of the plunger going by the pressure sensor in the well and it was above the pressure sensor and then when it goes below then the pressure sees this change in pressure pressure sensor sees this change in pressure of the plunger pa past the pressure sensor so if you have the the pl the pressure the plunger held by a catcher, then the plunger's weight is resting and held against the tubing wall. And when the catcher releases the, the, the plunger, you see a sudden drop in pressure versus the gas pressure had to build up equal to the weight of the plunger divided by the area to release the plunger. So here the well releases the plunger itself by increasing tubing pressure. And here the auto catcher releases the plunger, or you release the plunger from the catcher. And so the behavior of the signal is somewhat different where the well builds up the pressure, releases the plunger, and here the, here the uh, catcher is, was open to release the plunger. Now, here's a well down in the Barnett shell. It's a, it's, a, it's a gas well. doesn't make much liquid. And in the well, there's, there's only about 2 psi of liquid in the well. And here we re release the plunger, and now there's 5 psi of plunger weight and liquid in the tubing below the pressure sensor. And as the plunger's falling down the well, this is elapsed time, this, this pressure is getting less and less and less until right here the pressure difference stabilizes equal to the weight of the plunger. And so from, from this point to that point, the, the plunger lift well is telling you that it needs a standing valve because during shut-in all the liquid got pushed out and the plunger hit dry and the casing and the tubing pressure equalized at the end of shut-in so there's there's no liquid the plunger hit dry right here so this is a well that's telling you it needs a standing valve it's telling you that the pressure was there was maybe two psi is about a gallon not very much liquid in the tubing and then um, 3 psi from the plunger and then here the liquid's all gone so we need to if we're going to try to deliquefy this well with the plunger lift and uh, the tubing is set probably a little bit too high and needs a standing valve to keep the liquid from running back out the tubing during shut-in 
And there's the, the well that we have that's on the examples on our webpage. So here's two examples of this, this pressure phenomenon. So here we drop the plunger right here. It, it drops, and this is where the, the example is plunger stops in a tight spot. And then you can see the plunger, the plunger falling on the acoustic signal. And then when the plunger gets down to about 51 joints above the bottom, the whole 3 PSI pressure from the plunger disappears. This vertical line means it suddenly stop, stops. Well, here it suddenly started because it was released from the catcher, sudden drop. And here it suddenly stopped because it got trapped by a tight spot. And we see that. So we know the plunger to make the bottom. We can count the collars down to the depth. We know it's 51 joints off bottom. There's a tight spot right there. Now this one has a hole, a hole in the tubing. And so here we drop the plunger and it's falling down the well. And it says here it's 59th joint. And the 59th joint, you can see that as the plunger went by this little tiny hole, the gas in the casing started flowing back in, equalizing the pressure back where it was, where it was when you dropped the plunger, because this weight of the plunger pushed the gas out of the hole until the plunger went by and the plunger weight no longer on that hole. And so now the gas has to flow back in from the casing to equalize the pressure at the hole. And that's, that's what's happening right here. So you can see the plunger go by a hole. You could have shot the fluid level and seen an upkick at the hole too. And there's a there's an eighth of an inch diameter hole. This is a little itty bitty hole. And that little itty bitty hole caused the plunger not to come up 80% of the time, only about an eighth of an inch in diameter, a little tall, small hole. So it doesn't have to be very big to cause a big problem. Now this is a well that says the plunger hole is deep in the tubing. And what we see here is that, well, the green is the tubing pressure, no casing pressure. The red is the tubing pressure, the green is the casing pressure. And right there, the plunger goes by the hole and the pressure starts equalizing. And so, so we, can, we can see this pressure change by looking at the tubing pressure and we identify the hole. The hole's at 8520 and it's only about 400 foot off bottom. It was, it was, they were having a hard time seeing this hole. And once they tracked the plunger, they could easily see the see the hole in, in the tubing. So um, this behavior is it, it's just it's just the way it works. The way the plunger is significant and it shows up on the tubing pressure when the tube, when the plunger weights no longer uh, being held up by the gas. Now this this slide shows us that we use the tubing pressure and casing pressure to calculate the gas volumes. And so this is this is the gas. In blue is the formation gas flowing into the well, and the green is the gas that goes down the flow line. And, and, and sometime in the future, we'll, we'll include a discussion of this with the Foss and Gall presentation. Um, it, you know, it, it increases your safety by knowing where your plunger is. If you're, tracking a, if you're out working on a well and the plunger sticks a few feet below the surface, you can see what happens and not try to blow the plunger up dry and hit hit really hard. Uh, this high, these high velocities can cause cause damage, and it's, it's one of the things you want to know is where's, where's the plunger at? You can see where the plunger is by uh, tracking the plunger. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful feature. Now, this next slide here is, is we're going to talk about acquiring the data, and this is with the wireless equipment. And the, the wireless, uh, we call this the base station. It's sitting on the back of the vehicle. And we see line of sight to the remote fire gas gun, wireless gas gun on the tubing on the lubricator. And we've got one also on the casing. And we were uh, the, the wireless equipment lets you have three gas guns attached to the well or three sensors, one gas gun and two pressure transducers. Maybe you want a pressure sensor on the casing or a gas gun on the casing. Maybe you want one on the, the pressure sensor on the lubricator. So so this is, this is uh, some additional features we have available with the, the, the wireless equipment. We have to pick a well, and this this Charlie Lambert A760 well is on the memory, on the example data, and we're going to pick it. And if if one wouldn't already on your computer, you have to create it, and you need things like production rates and tubing casing sizes, average joint joint length, end of tubing and C nipple depth, and the formation per rate intervals to to track the plunger. Um, this is the first screen. Once we go into plunger lift, where we're going to we have on the well. This is the the well bore with the remote fire gas gun attached to the tubing, 
and we can preview and identify where the, where the different sensors are attached. And then we also have another Gascon on the casing. And to start acquisition, we quit, click there. But before we start acquisition, we probably want to open the valves and determine and make sure that the the pressure sensor gas gun that we think we have is on on the tubing and also the ones on the casing. So I'll be I'll be previewing this and then I'll see the valve open. I'll see the pressure go up on the tubing. I'll be previewing the casing pressure, open the valve and see the casing pressure go up. So I want to make sure I've got the correct sensors on the correct uh, valve and use a preview to make sure that is correct before I start acquisition. Um, we also have an option, an optional sensor, like we can put on the separator, the sales line. If you're uh, wanting to watch your uh, pressures on on the other side of your uh, motor valve, so that's something you could possibly do. Uh, the preview is used to identify and make sure everything is hooked up right. So that's how preview is used. Um, we have in this case two two gas guns. And we're going to go into the different gas guns and, and zero the pressure on the gas guns before we start acquisition. And so we'll click, click on the details button and then get the zero offset of the pressure transducer before we start. And then once we uh, will have it have it zero before we apply pressure to the to, to the gas gun. Uh, this is just previewing the data and it's saying we're previewing and you see here that we we open the valve right here between the gas gun and the well on the tubing and we see this hop in pressure and we knew that was the gun attached and we see that it's hooked up correctly and so that means we're okay ready to start the test we stop previewing and well before we stop we want to make sure we set set the sample speed correct so the sample speed again is 30 samples per second typically for a padded plunger because they typically fall slow, they seal well. And then probably 60%, 60 samples per second for two, for a padded for a solid plunger. And then for a bypass plunger or two-piece plunger, 120, 240, or 480 samples per second. The the two-piece plungers fall really fast. So you may have to go at 480 samples per second. You won't sample very long, but you'll have to sample fast and you may want to try to uh, sample 480 samples a second in your office before you go to well to make sure your uh, computer is fast enough to keep up with the high speed data before you run a test at the well. So now we we stopped acquisition, we stopped previewing, we've got our sampling speed set, and we're ready to start acquisition. We click the start acquisition button, and the software starts streaming in the data streams from the tubing and the casing, the acoustic and the pressure. If we click one of these little buttons with the arrow on them. This screen pops up and shows you the day that that we always all the day we've recorded so far from the beginning of the test. It shows you the current time, the duration, and the signal at that point. This is the last minute, and this is the uh, current minute of real-time data streaming in. And so you you can watch this during the acquisition of the data, looking for some kind of problem or issue in the well. Uh, each of these. Each of these points will, will blow this, this up to a full screen so that you can see the data that you're acquiring in detail. Um, you really want to start the acquisition on the well before uh, shutting begins or before uh, unloading begins so that you have a complete cycle that you want to analyze. It, it works a little better to for the, the software to uh, comply, acquire a complete shut-in cycle which you want to determine fall velocity from the beginning of the test till the end. Uh, here we're counting collars and we're looking at the screen we're seeing that the plunger's fallen uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, about six times the average joint length feet per minute and that's a good estimate to see how fast it's falling so you come I typically watch this uh, acoustic tab and keep a, an average idea about how fast the plunger is falling. Um, and here it's talking about how you might estimate that depth and the de uh, velocity to see how, how quick the plunger will get to the bottom. Uh, the plunger typically slows down as it gets deeper in the well. Uh, here's the tubing pressure signal for the entire time period that we collected data. Uh, here is the uh, pressure drop right there when we open the motor valve. 
uh, there's a button called annotate. And so the annotate button purpose is to record things that happen at the well. And we can use those annotations to analyze the trace at a later date. Or you can identify problems that you that you see. When I first went out to track plungers, I just I just write information on a yellow sheet and I'd have two or three pieces of two or three pages of paper and it'd be hard to go back and and uh, uh, line those events up with uh, 500,000 data points that I collect uh, over uh, an hour and a half. So the annotate button fixes that problem. We click on the annotate button, we click on a point that we see, and then we something happens off the well, we say, well, the valve opened, or liquid arrives, or plunger arrives, valve closes, and so each of these events are marked on here. And these are, these are default uh, method uh, events that occurred you can also have a comment about something that's not a, a typical event that would occur and those annotations can then be displayed on the trace or in the reports. Um, so now we've, we've got any time that you want you can look at the, the annotate data and see what's going on with the well. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feature that has a lot of flexibility uh, that lets you zoom in and look at a particular event, annotate, record a comment. Uh, so here we've got this uh, the scroll bar at the bottom of the annotation. We can change those we can change the view on the screen. We have the casing pressure screen, casing pressure data, the tuning pressure data, and the acoustic signal. We can use our magnifying glass to select a particular point and zoom in. We can change the, the, the time, the range of the time, and we can um, examine the data in more detail. Once we're finished collecting a set of data, we hit the stop button to stop acquiring data. Uh, the software says, are you sure? And you say yes. Um, we added the are you sure because sometimes if you just accidentally click the stop, it would stop before you were finished. It's happened to me a few times. And so we added a second stop to make sure that the real uh, intent was to stop acquisition. It wasn't an accident. So it, you say stop and then it says are you sure yes you want to stop you click it twice now this is a this is an example of a data set where we left the equipment on the well over overnight and we acquired 20 hours of data and this is a Charlie Lambert well a-760 on October the 8th 2016 uh, there's about 20 20 cycles here or so not quite that not quite 20 uh, there's 20 hours with the data, probably 19 cycles. We sampled at 30 samples a second. There's 1,200 minutes of data. Uh, you can click on any point. You can you can you can analyze any cycle here you want to analyze. Um, we'll look at that in a little bit when we look at the data. Um, we thought it was important that we could in the, in the TWM software we only get maybe uh, eight hours. Uh, we can get much more longer time periods with the TAM so TAM software. For acquiring data. Um, this is a wireless remote fire gas gun that we leave at the well and we don't have to put in a plastic bag anymore. We've, we've done some uh, improvements on the gun. We've replaced the plastic button. We've, we've replaced the uh, connect connector for the charge fitting. We've, we've uh, improved the insulation so it's, it's pretty weather proof. Not 100% weather proof but it's pretty, pretty weather proof. We leave them out on the well now, and we don't uh, wrap them up in a, a plastic bag. So that's that's a good a good feature that we've done. Uh, this is the way we arrange the uh, base station and in in, in leave it at the well. We have the laptop inside a, a case that's weatherproof, a battery to keep it running, a laptop running. We have a fan on the bottom that cools the laptop, and an ch auto charger that keeps the laptop charged along with keeps the base station communicating. Uh, we have the on our on our help. If you click on help, the uh, the, the steps we just talked about are in, under help, and then there's a plunger lift manual. That's also it's like a 150 page manual. If you click that button, and the manual is tied to the plunger lift normal example. The plunger lift cycle no, normal cycle is the a, a cycle that's analyzed in the manual. So it's kind of a tutorial. You have the manual. That's a tutorial step-by-step. Step. 
and you have the, the TAM software you can download from our webpage, and you have the examples that go right along with the manual that you can follow step by step to analyze. And that's available for you to use if you're interested in learning more about analyzing a plunderless cycle. Um, you know, this, this, this tool minimizes your need for a wire line, lets you see in the well. Uh, you can count the collars down to where the plunger stops at the collar stop or the C nipple. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a quick and easy way to identify problems in the well. And you can see when the plunger hits the bottom or not going to bottom. So with that, that's the end of the presentation. And I probably am ready for some questions if you would like. Yes, uh, we have a few questions only. I think we have like nine questions so far. Uh, one of the questions is in slide number six, I think you were in the beginning of the presentation. And if you were uh, talking about having a half inch, four valve or a quarter tone valve high, or I, I assume that he was asking about what we connect the gas line to the lubricator. All right, so so you know a lot of, a needle valve is a is like a little pin that blocks the signal. So you really don't want you don't want to have a needle valve here. You'd like to replace the needle valve. You have one on the well with a, with a fully opening valve. You want the the you don't want to tie the gun directly to the well because that means you're going to have to shut the well in, and that will change the cycle and won't be stabilized conditions. So you and you would like to have your gas gun vertical so that the any liquid that comes in during unloading will run right back out. Was, was, did that answer your question? I, I guess it does. I think it was asking about the port size and oh. the type of part where we connect the gun. Well, half side, half half inch or larger is fine. I mean, we we we. Uh, I don't think you should probably use much smaller than that. But a half inch, mm. you know, it's it's a, the whole the whole half inch valve is about a quarter of an inch. It's not very big. Okay, I hope that answers the question for Joel. So we have a, a question from Hector asking uh, if the well must be prepared in advance to avoid different tubing sizes in the stream. Oh, well, if you have different tubing sizes in your tubing string, then a plunger won't won't seal. You won't have, you can't run the plunger. So you're going to have to have either set your uh, bumper spring at the at the taper at the junction and just run the plunger from constant diameter. I don't think there's any any uh, plunger that can run in two and seven eighths and two and three inch tubing taper. Yeah. We have uh, another question from uh, Manuel. He's asking if there is no gas pressure to power the motor valve through the controller, what are the options? He's asking if a nitrogen cylinder, etc. What are other options we have? Yeah, you could you could probably pull the casing pressure or nitrogen cylinder. Those are two common methods. Okay. And there's a, a person asking Carrie Ann, is this tubing and casing pressure measured at the well head, or is the tubing pressure measured at the bottom of the well? Right. So so this picture right here is a system connected to the well. And so the gas gun's at the lubricator and the pressure sensor is at the surface on the casing. And then the bottom hole pressures are calculated based on the measured properties and the input properties of the oil, water, and gas in the well. Right. Those both are surface pressures. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Mo Yunus is asking, could you explain dimensions of plunger and how much space in between ID tubing or audio plunger? But then I think that was answered on the slide number 30, I think, where you have a comment on the, uh, you have an eight pound plunger on a 238 uh, OB. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, the, the pad, the pads actually touch the well. So the, the pads are in contact with the tubing wall. Um, a solid plunger or a brush plunger has a small gap and as the plunger runs in the well the, the, they, they check the OD of the, the plunger periodically maybe every three months or less to see if the wear has caused the 
plunger to leak too much. And so this, the brush plunger tends to wear out a lot faster than the solid plunger or the padded plunger. But the padded plunger is in contact with, uh, with the tubing wall to provide the seal. It's very efficient. Okay. And another question is, the wells that come up dry, is it better to have downtime and increase afterflow? And this is specifically for a well with two or three eighths single pad. Well, you know, sometimes sometimes when a plunger comes up dry, it's not because there's too much energy. There, it comes up dry because the shut-in time wasn't long enough or there's some kind of uh, restriction in the tubing. So before you can really know what to do, you need to track the plunger and make sure it's getting to bottom. And then you need to, if it's getting to bottom, then you need to increase the afterflow time to bring in more liquid and reduce the energy in the well. But but just coming up dry, it could come up dry for other 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 reasons, which the two offhand would be it comes up dry because there's uh, no liquid, it comes which would be not enough afterflow. It comes up dry because it's not getting the bottom, which is means it has a short rise. It comes up dry because it stops on some kind of debris or scale. So those are the the three reasons I can think of, and there's probably more I can't think of right now. So, so you need to check and see if it's make sure it's getting the bottom. I have a question from Ken asking if we can change the sample speed during the acquisition. No, once you once you set the sampling speed for us for a test, it'll say that sampling speed till you stop it. And so you kind of need to think about before you start the test to set the sampling speed based on the plunger type. So um, that's why I mentioned the 480 sample per second for the two-piece plunger. You can see the sleeve falling through the gas as long as the sleeve is above the liquid in the in the tubing. If you have EUE tubing and sample 40 sample per second, but if your computer gets choked with all that data and blows up after a minute or two, then that would be a waste of time. So the first thing you should do when you're sampling at high speed is sample in your office for the time, maybe the hour that you plan to track the plunger, and make sure your computer will handle all that data. It's got, it's a lot of data, 40 samples a second on off of tubing pressure, casing pressure, acoustic signal, it's a lot of a lot of data. So no, you have to you have to you have to set the time when you start the test. I'm gonna link uh, another question from Manuel related to the same point. It is uh, if you could mention again uh, the sample rates versus the plunger type. We have a table available if not just mention it. Um, fast plungers you have to sample fast because they go really quickly by the collars. And you can't hear them if you don't sample fast enough. It just looks like noise. So it's it's just a you have to sample faster. And you also can't hear the plunger usually probably over half the time once it falls into the gassy fluid column. Okay, um, Sergio is asking how to avoid contamination with liquids when slug arrives. And I'm assuming he's talking about the gas gun contamination. Yeah, probably the gas gun. And that's a good question. I didn't even say anything about that. The first time I tracked the plunger, I didn't cock the gun and fill it with, fill it with gas. And then when I uh, took it off the well, it sprayed sprayed condensate all over me. And then I go, gee, that was a mistake. So, so whenever you track a plunger with a gas gun, you have to charge a gas gun if it's a remote fire gas gun to a pressure greater than, internal pressure greater than the, the maximum pressure you see in the well. So let's say your pressure goes up to 400 PSI during during the cycle, then you need to put more than 400 PSI nitrogen pressure in the gas gun to keep the gas valve closed. Don't use CO2 because the CO2, if you do a test for like four hours, even though the O-rings are designed for CO2 gas, after four, four hours the, the O-rings will get CO2 dissolved in O-rings, and then when you release the pressure of the gas gun to fire the shot, the O-rings will, will fizz as the CO2 comes out and they'll pop. So you should try to always use nitrogen gas to charge the gas gun to a pressure greater than well pressure. And you, and then also if you have a compact gas gun to manually lock the, lock the valve so it doesn't open. So yeah, close the valve before you track the plunger, you'll have a, a, a cleanup job. Um, when you track the, after you get done tracking the plunger. Okay. 
things. And we have another question from Yula Tang asking if we can load, that's the, related to the TAM software. If we can load the SCADA tubing head pressure and casing head pressure into the TAM. No, no, the, the, the echo meter equipment is typically proprietary. We only use sensors that, that, uh, that we know how they perform. And so we want to be able to use high resolution sensors to get high resolution data to, tra to track the plunger. Okay, uh, I have a question from Anil Yoshi that I'm guessing is related to the uh, plunger lift system as a whole. He says, he says, is it possible for deviated wells? The, usually plunger lift, you don't run the plunger past about 60 degrees, maybe 40 degrees because the plunger won't come back up if you run it out too deep. So you have to be really ca careful about running the plunger deeper in the well, then you can get the plunger to, to seal and come back up. So uh, some plungers, padded plungers, if you lay them on the side, the pads in the bottom will collapse and then they won't, they won't go anymore. They'll just leak. So you have to be cautious about running the plunger deeper than uh, 40 to 75 degrees. You can get some plungers to work deeper than that. Um, but to find holes, you can see holes uh, both by taking a fluid level shot. There's a dual shot method Carrie Ann's going to talk about in the future. And by the way, the plunger going by the by the hole. But if it if the well is in a horizontal, if the hole is in the horizontal, then the plunger is not vertical anymore, and there's no plunger weight on the gas. So I don't think it will work if it's in the horizontal section of the well. Okay. Um, we have a, a generic question, and Ali is asking, what is the production range for this technology? Um, the, the technology that we... The, the, the main technology is the C in the plunger uh, velocity falling in the well. And that works when the plunger is falling through gas. And it, it's very difficult, unless the pressure is very high, to see the plunger fall through the liquid. And so the primary, the, so the primary use would be in wells that have s some, some gas in the tubing. The, 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 well can't, the tubing can't be completely full of gas, or you won't be able to see the plunger perform. So that's that's probably the main restriction, and so you can still record tubing casing pressure. We've got some data on some 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 uh, gas-assisted plunger lift wells, but we can't see the plunger because there's so much liquid, so much high liquid rate. Um, you know, usually above about 100 barrels of liquid a day, uh, you start to have the tubing fairly full of liquid and running some kind of continuous run plunger. And it becomes difficult to see the plunger because now the tubing is almost almost full of liquid. So it's typically a, a, a lower rate a lower rate liquid well. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark is asking, can the software or sensors determine plunger wear and lift inefficiency? Uh, that's that's a good question. So one of the things that we've that we've uh, added in the current version of TAM is a plunger echo meter plunger performance coefficient. And the plunger performance coefficient is how fast does that plunger fall in your well? And so as as the plunger wears, the plunger performance coefficient is going to become going to change. It's it, it's it's almost like a the velocity, it's almost like the fall velocity of a new plunger is what the plunger performance coefficient kind of is. Not not quite, but it's kind of like that. And so so um, so the answer is, if you track the plunger f frequently over a lapse period of time, and you saw the plunger performance coefficient to be changing, then that would indicate that the plunger is is wearing wearing out. So the answer is yes. We don't have any data where we've done that. It would be cool to do it because it would definitely, if you mic the plunger and you track the plunger, there is a, a definite relationship between the seal of the plungers it wears and, this, and the, 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 the wear of the plunger and the plunger performance coefficient. So yes, but we don't have any data that we could show that. Hey, uh, 
Dan is asking if you have any comments on wells with packers. Uh, you know, plunger lift doesn't, conventional plunger lift doesn't like packers. Gas lift likes packers. So a lot of times when your well starts to deplete, you want to convert the well from uh, a flowing well with a packer to a well without a packer because you want to use a casing annulus and it's going to cost you money to take the packer out so you might try to be low cost and shoot a hole through the tubing to use the casing annulus if your packer is set very high above the formation that's like setting your setting your your seam nipple high and it causes the cycle to not be steady and, and the liquid will collect below the hole in the tubing to the top of the formation and slug in the tubing and kill your cycle so you typically have to operate at much higher casing pressures much lower load factors if you have a packer with a hole shot through the tubing to use a casing casing uh, I it, it's a lot easier without a packer plunger lift conventional plunger lift is a lot easier without a packer um, so that that's that's my comments about a packer Okay, uh, Darryl has another question. Hypothetically, what would be the lowest borehole pressure required to move a plunger in 2138 EUE tubing at 3,000 feet with oh. a daily production of 15 barrels a day? <laughs> That's a quick, quick answer. Well, there. okay, well, see, there's a, what you should do is email Gustavo or me or Carrie Ann and ask us to, to send for you to ask us to send you that Foss and Golf spreadsheet. It has rules of thumb and calculations of the spreadsheet. And we can tell you what the pressure required to bring the plunger up is. Uh, 15 barrels a day means you have to make quite a few cycles, but you're not very deep, so you can make you can make fairly fast cycles because it's not very deep. Um, you know, your 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 unloading time you just want to try to get about 750 feet per minute. So you know, it it the plunger coming up at 750 a minute takes about four minutes to come up. So you know, it's it, it you could. The advantage is a shallow well. You can make quite a few cycles, and you can if you if you divide your cycles up into uh, you, if you have many cycles, and you can still run your plunger, then probably you could probably I've seen I've seen casing pressures as low as 40 psi uh, on a well that's 5,000 foot and works just fine. I've seen wells out in Durango with casing pressures as low as 50 psi and those are deeper than that. So I'd, I'd, I'd expect you could probably run down to 20, 24 psi surface casing pressure, 25 psi uh, uh, gauge pressure on a plunger well and get the plunger to run and, and possibly produce 15 barrels a day but it'd be tough because you're gonna have to make lots of cycles to, to, to smooth out to, to make that liquid load small. You know, the liquid load is what you're trying to lift, and you're trying to spread that liquid load out over many cycles so the pressure is low. Um, 15, 15 barrels of liquid is like 1,500 psi of pressure. And so you have to divide that 1,500 psi pressure into, into um, by the number of cycles to get how much pressure per cycle. And then at a minimum, you have to have a load factor of... We have Foss and Gall is more exact, but a low factor of two. So I mean, we can we can figure out we can probably figure that out with with Foss and Gall. But the main the main it's possible in this well because you're shallow. That's the main benefit you have. Probably 25 psi and and oh, geez, a lot of cycles. Okay. Well, Tyler is asking when the plunger hits the standing valve and it's resting on bottom during the during a plunger track. Is there a way to see if the standing valve is leaking? Yes. Yeah, sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, um, the the standing valve, if it leaks, leaks, leaks pressure, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show you that the uh, two main casing pressure are getting closer together. And so the, the, this, this, the slide I showed earlier, let me just go show you that. I mean, let me bring up Tam here. And I don't see Tam. There it was right there. Okay, this is this is Tam, and the question the question that's being asked is, are these two lines getting closer together? And if they are, is there a standing valve in the well? And if the answer is yes, then 
the same out as leaking. And so if we go back over to this um, this uh, one well that says um, we're pushing, this is a well that needs a standing valve. We open this one up and we look at this data. This is in TAM. See this distance from here to here is is getting closer and closer and then right there the distance is the same. And so so this, this is an example let me change my screen just a little bit here because it's hiding the pictures of everybody. So when I look at this data here, the the, the distance is is liquid. This vertical distance represents liquid or pressure. And so at this point right here, the pressure is constant. That's the way the plunger. And so in this from this point from here, from that point right there, which is at 113, to that point right there, which is uh, 129. So that's like that's like 16 minutes, a little more than 16 minutes during shut-in. From the time the well shuts in to 16 minutes of shut-in, the liquid in this low liquid rate well is all pushed out. And if there were a standing valve in this well, it would be leaking. And so this is what you'd see. You'd see this pressure difference get closer together. So that would be that'd be the answer. Yes, you can see that. Well, we have several other questions. Let me let me pick one of those. Uh, one question says, can a salt block, a salt block, be identified between casing and tubing? And that's uh, more related to the blue level shot between tubing and casing. Right, right. So, so, so a salt block, if it's completely blocked off, it won't move. And so the the, the pressure, the surface casing pressure won't change during the cycle of the of the of the Plunger, and so if you have a case, if you have a a, a salt block, it, it it reduces the area that you have in the casing. It it provides less energy to bring the plunger up, and the casing pressure doesn't change because it's blocked. It's trapped. It's trapped. Now, you can you can uh, shoot a fluid level down the casing and 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 release the plunger from the bottom. And if the casing pressure doesn't change and the liquid level doesn't move. It's likely due to some kind of blockage. So the behavior of the liquid level, behavior of the casing pressure, often indicates a, 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 lack, a, a lack of the ability of the gas in the casing to communicate to the tubing. And so that would be a, a salt, salt block in the casing above the end of the tubing. Okay. Um, Jula Tang has a question. Do you know if there is any difference using echometer in gap of gas lift as it is the point that well, has almost no shutting time and gas is continuously injected from gas lift valve? Right, right. So 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 one of the problems that we have with the the so far, I was I've been talking to Jim Lee off and on about this for a long time and he and I wrote that book on to liquefying gas wells, and one of the issues that we have is that when the plunge in a gap of well, there's there's the liquid is filling the tubing, and so we can't we can't see the plunger unless you start to intermit the cycle so that you have some gas in the tubing for the plunger to fall through. So we really can't see the 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 plunger behavior in a, a well that the tubing's full of liquid. But Jim is working right now on a model that will predict it. So eventually we're probably going to have a model we'll talk about because gas-assisted plunger lift is a pretty popular lift method. And so that's something we're very active, active about working on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised when we have something we can try out here in the next month or so, maybe the next one or two months. So, yeah, we're, we're working on that. Uh how can you compute the flow and bottom pressure using the acoustic trace? Well, it's the way the gas plus the way the liquid column, and so um, and you measure the surface pressure. So you you know the you know the surface pressure, you know the way the gas, and 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 almost always, if there's no packer and the casing valve is closed, the liquid level on a plunger lift well is is always at the end of the tubing. So if it's not in the tubing, usually there's a hole in the tubing where the gas is lifting liquid up the casing annulus and, and, and flowing back in the tubing through a hole. So, so it's just, it's just, it's just uh, we know the liquid properties, we know the production rate, you tell us that, and we just use a, um, the 
standard pressure calculation to come up with it. So it's, it's not it's not a problem at all to calculate the pressure in the tubing. And then there's some assumptions below that about how much liquid of water and oil are mixed below below the below the in the tubing. Uh, Sergio has a question that says, "What is the usage of the microphone signal in the case? Can we just that, that, that. use the pressure uh, sensor installed without the gun in the casing in order to reduce price?" Well, and that's really that's a, that's a, a, yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's the normal way the test is run. So normally we run the test with um, a pressure sensor on the casing, and so so what I what I was wanting to do. With with the two gas guns, is I had a had a feeling, but no data to prove it that when the plunger falls, you can you can see the the signal on the casing gas gun when the plunger hits the bottom. So the reason the reason why we let me find that data here. I think it's right here, right here maybe. Yeah, this is this is the I want to talk about. So so this data right here. Uh, we recorded the tubing acoustic and the casing acoustic. And this is the only well I've done that on that I can that I can recall. And I wanted to see right here on this signal, this is a, the black is the acoustic signal. I wanted to see if I could see the pressure hop or the or the bang when the plunger hit bottom and on some of these traces we can. So so let me just show you that real quick here. I'm going, to, I'm going to expand this to be full screen here. And then I'm going to take this magnifying glass right here and go into this data right here. And there's our signal. And I'm, what I'm wanting to know is, did is that an indication of the plunger being on bottom? And so... I've got two microphone signals there. One's on the casing in red and one's on the tubing in black. And so you just see one black signal signal because the microphone signal from the microphone on the tubing is much louder than this quiet casing. So I'm going to go into the settings and make sure both of them are turned on. Both of them are turned on right there. And so I turn them on and you still can't see anything. So so I'm going to I'm going to zoom into this right here. And I'm going to look. I guess it's in green. And and sure enough, look, you can see a little spike right there in green and black. So the microphone on the casing heard the same signal of the plunger in the tubing. And so I, this is what I was looking for. I was looking for that. And then I was hoping that if I turn off the casing, I'm going to turn off this casing pressure reading here. Go into this, this, this right here and turn off the casing pressure reading. Turn this off, and then normally you'll see a little pressure hop. I don't see one right there, but in some of these, in some of these tests on this well, I'd see a little pressure hop that would confirm that's the plunger getting on bottom. So that was that was the reason why we did that test was to to be able to see um, determine if we could see the plunger hit bottom by look at listening to the casing acoustic signal. And the and the answer is I think we saw it and it's not it's not it didn't show up on every, every every as you can see here it didn't show up on every one but but that's why I don't know if you have time for more questions or you would like to go through the samples what do you want me to do? well let's go ahead and ask me the question and then pretty quick we're going to look at the data okay so we have a, a couple of more questions uh, can we find uh, this is from Salinas he's asking. Can you find a washout valve on a gable well? Just assisted plunger leak well. See, that's that gets back to the the, the thing that Carrie Ann's going to talk about, the, the dual shot method. And so, so the so, so the answer is is some, somewhat when we had classes probably five years ago. If someone said, "Can you find can you find the washed out gas lift valve?" We would have said no. Because there's no hole there, it's just a gas lift valve. But if you shoot the gas gun on one side of or the casing on the tubing side of the well and listen with another gas gun microphone on the other side, the washed out valves will pass the signal through. And so you can you can. So that we've written a paper 
on um, finding finding washed out valves and bad check valves on gas with wells with two gas guns. You shoot on one gun and listen on the other at the exact same time and the valves that leak will pass this, the, the pressure wave through and you'll hear it on the other, other pipe. So we can, if you're interested in that, we'll send you, we can send you a, a, a uh, eventually. If you'll just, go ahead, you Karen. can type a quick message here um, and I'll, I'll email you the, yeah. the technical paper and then we'll, we'll talk about it. I can email you the paper and a presentation that'll explain it. Sure. That's a good, good question. I think we might have to get the mail. Okay. Um, uh, kind of a generic question is, what is the max well depth we can use with this kind of pumps or artificial uh, Well, uh, one of the things we said when we first started off was that it's not really depth depth limited. And so I have data on a well that's like 15,000 foot deep that someone tracked a plunger uh, very clearly all the way to the bottom and could see the plunger. And so, so it's it's not it's not the idea of of a, you're not depth limited, you're limited based on the travel time, and every trip takes time, and so the longer time means less trips per day, and the less liquid you can carry per day. So, a deep well means you can, you have less trips. A deep well means you can only unload maybe three barrels of liquid instead of. 10 barrels of liquid for a, a shallower well because you can't make the number of trips to get the liquid out. So you're not you're not limited by depth. You're limited by the the, the time for the trips and how many trips you can make. Well, let's do it. This last question asking, how can we know the corrosion between tubing and plunger? Um, I, I would I would say that the, the performance coefficient changes and the plunger velocity changes. And so, so um, what you'll see is that the plunger velocity is a function of the gas flow rate in the tubing. It's also a function of the seal. And so if you have a, a, a very corroded area of, of pipe, the seal is going to be poor and the plunger is going to speed up. And so the, the, the plot of plunger velocity would be an indication of, of two things, gas flow into the tubing and uh, seal or corroded tubing. Well, we have a couple of more questions if you don't mind. I don't mind. Okay, well. Uh, can we use a computer to find out if gas lift injection valve multi-pump uh, multi injection? Uh, uh, we have packers and we can not, uh, we can shoot from under. We can find valves that are leaking, but we can't find probably find the valves that are doing multi injection. Now, multi point injection, uh, then another company, AppSmith, has a CO2 technique that they use where they inject a slug of CO2 and then it goes down the casing with the, with the gas lift gas, and any multi point valve takes some of that CO2 and back up the tubing. So you can, you can, you can, um, push your liquid level down the tubing with echometer equipment and shoot dual shots and find leaky valves, but you can't do it while it's producing the well. Okay. On, on gas assisted plunger lift, does compressor need to be off to minimize the noise? Will that matter? You know, the, the, you, that's, good, that's a good question. And, and so, you know, the compressor makes noise, and so if we're trying to track a plunger, um, and it's it's being picked up, and when it's being picked up on the on the tubing, it, it, sometimes you may not be able to, it may be too noisy. So, you know, compressor noise could be a problem tracking a plunger down the tubing if we're getting that noise in the tubing, but if it's on the casing, I'm not sure it's going to be much of an issue. So, so that's... Yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't think I don't think that the for sure if it's being picked up on the tubing and it's noisy you, you just won't be able to uh, tr track it. Um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna minimize this. What's the next question? And I'm gonna go pick up a, a well here. Uh, one more question is: uh, control valve closed, and line, pre line pressure declines. How? Uh, what possible cause 
stability? What's the possible form of stability? Well, line pressure declines means that, um, so that means you have uh, some kind of, the, the, the flow is going away from the, the motor valve down the flow line, the line pressure is dropping because of, um, could be a leak on the, on the outside between the, between the separator and the um, motor valve, it could be something like that. Or you, maybe you're pulling gas off that that, that line there to, to run your to run something. I mean, but normally we we have we have a troubleshoot spreadsheet. So if you're wanting to, I've got two Excel spreadsheets that, that other people put together that list different problems and show uh, what you should do. Like do this, check this first, check this second, check this third. So if you're interested in me sending those two troubleshooting spreadsheets, one's for watching the well from the office on the control system, and the other one is going out to the well to inspect the well, then email me at lynn at equity.com and I'll send you those two spreadsheets. So, or anybody else should have those. So we can, anybody can send those. So, but we have those spreadsheets. So is that the last question, Gustavo? Yes, so far that's the last question. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's talk about so on my screen here, I've got I've got the TAM software opened up, and I have gone into. Let me just do it again. I go into pick a well, and when you when you get the data files off of the Echometer webpage on the Ask Echometer, then those uh, when you when you load them into TAM, TAM by default will put the first. Uh, presentation on acoustic and down markers in this folder and then the second presentation on mechanical friction in this folder and then the presentation today will be the third presentation on plunger tracking conventional plungers and so they'll they'll be put it on your computer and then inside when I when I open the, click on the plus inside echo meter online plunger tracking then there's one two three four five six seven examples and so the, the example I want to talk about first is the, the one that we put in the manual. So if you go into the plunder of normal cycle and open that open that up and then go to the plunger lift well right right here, then this is the plunger lift well and um, I have the casing pressure turned off. So let me turn the casing pressure back on. So I go into settings and click casing pressure. And so now I've got the casing pressure turned back on. Um, let me just kind of show you a few features, and then I'll let me show you first the manual. So if you, this is the well that the manual is based on. So if you go into utilities, not utilities, help. If you go into help, help, you click on help, then the help appears on your screen. And it shows us that there's a plunger lift manual help. And if I click on the plunger lift manual help, then this manual is 128 pages. I thought it was more than that, but 128 pages. And around page 50 is where we go through step by step on how to analyze this data. And so, 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 um, what's my point? My point is that on your computer now, if you download TAM, you have the manual and the data set that you can use to go through and learn about this software and it's and you can ask us questions, you can email us questions, you got a data set that's been collected and it matches up with the manual and you can if you're interested learn about just just that with this just that method. Now I think that's a pretty powerful tool that you can then use to understand plunger lift. We've got four or five or six examples here that are really good examples plus we have this example that goes along with the manual. Now, when you look at this, this when you open up Plunger Lift, you see this screen. It's telling us that we have 92 minutes of data here. This this screen right here at the very top is the entire data set. So if I take my mouse and I put my mouse right here and I drag this line over, it changes what I'm seeing on the screen. If I drag it to right there, and then drag this right here, I'm gonna I'm gonna see a detailed view of what when the plunger comes up. And so right now. All I can see is this black uh, fuzz here, the microphone signal, and it hides the tubing pressure in the background. So an option to fix this is to go into this and then move the tubing acoustic 
move it down, and then that will make the the uh, tubing pressure be shown first on top, and then the acoustic behind it, so we can see that. So there's a lot of flexibility in the way this stuff is displayed by by what? By looking at the settings. Now these dash lines right here are the annotations that we mark this trace with while we were acquiring data. So when we were acquiring data, we saw the, the liquid arrive and we saw the plunger arrive. And so we put those annotations on this screen, on this data set, so that we could mark this and know what happened right there for later analysis. And so this, this is the entire time right here. And I can move through this time and look at it. Um, I can change the time right here to a certain time interval. Here's 10.826 minutes. I can see when it started. And I can see when the test ended. I can, I can see the duration of the test in time. I can see my sampling speed. If I click on the graph with my mouse, then there'll be a pointer that comes here, and that's the time that I clicked on the graph, and these are the tubing and the casing pressure readings at that time. And I can move this line around to whatever, whatever I want to examine on the trace. This will zoom the trace out completely to the full screen back to all 92 minutes of data. And so there's all the data. When I look at this screen and I go to the report, well, let me go a little, let me go a little farther. So if you want this data to go into an Excel spreadsheet, you can come down here and click on the export button. And all these data points can be exported into a file that you could then use to do whatever you want with. If you want to embed the graph in a report, you can right click on the graph and copy the image to a clipboard. And that could be pasted into Excel or Word or uh, Notepad, whatever you wanted to do. So any of the data that's on the screen, any of the data, uh, the plots, any of the pictures can be exported out. That's all available. Um, if I go in to analyze the cycle, and this is the cycle I'm going to analyze, um, I can click Cycle, and I can say Add a Cycle. And so this is the cycle I just added, and I go to define the cycle, and this screen pops up, and I'm going to say the valve, what, well, I'm going to first of all, I'm going to turn the casing pressure back on. So there's my casing pressure, tuning pressure, and acoustic signal. And the cycle begins right here when the valve closes. So I say valve closes to begin the cycle, and say yes. And so this is the beginning of the cycle right here. And I'm just going to get kind of close. And this is the end of the cycle right there. And then this is the, right there, that's point B, when the, when the valve opens. And so those aren't very close. So what I'll do is I, once I've got those points picked, I'll put in like five minutes of time and make the window small. I'll tab out of the field. And now I can see that I didn't pick it very close. So I'll click right there on the, when the tubing pressure sen sensor motor valve open and tuning pressure starts to drop. Then I'll click back on the valve open and I'm going to move it over to when the pressure starts to build and the microphone signal start to get quiet. And that's when the right about there is where this shut-in began. You can see the signal on the of the plunger falling by the tubing collar recesses on the EUE tubing. And then I'll go to the cycle limits. And this has got the annotation shown here. And so if I go here, I'd say, um, what? I'd say plunger hits liquid, and I come down here and pick the, the annotation. Well, let's do, let's do this one first. A plunger on bottom is right there, and let's go pick plunger on bottom. So I'm going to go pick two and say plunger on bottom and apply to the marker. And it just, so if you annotate this, the cycle out in the field, you can use those annotations later on to, to, to identify those events back in the office. And so the next one is liquid arrives. And I'm going to put that one to liquid arrives right here. And then apply to marker. And then the next one is plunger arrives. And that's, that's right here. 
And if I want to see it in more detail, let me just let me zoom in and show you what's going to happen here. So so there is the annotation. I say uh, there's I want to make look plunderize right there at the annotation. And I select that and I say apply to the marker. And now I've got my cycle selected. And I'm going to go to plunger fall now. And so there's the plunger falling down the well. And that's when the motor valve, when the plunger left the lubricator. So that's the first collar it went by at the surface time zero. And then here is the next one. And then it starts to jump to the next collar automatically. And I just say add a collar. And once it's being pretty consistent, and the signal is really clean. I can say auto select and it'll select all the rest. And it went all the way to the end. And sure enough, it's got uh, all the colors counted. And here the fall velocity in the gas, you can't read it, it's 168. The fall velocity in the liquid is 38.9, about 40 feet per minute. If I blow this, blow this uh, fall velocity trace up and look at it in more detail, here's, here's the fall velocity plot. It's on top of that other one. And if I click on a point like right here, then the, the, the table rotates to that point. It's color 64. It shows color 64 here. It says we're at a depth of 1,513 feet. The fall velocity is 227 feet per minute. And we're at that clock time. Well, I don't really want clock time here. I want, I want, I want, I want minutes. So if I go down here and click on this clock, well, maybe not there. I want it in minutes. So if I go back over here and find this, this right here, I can change the time to minutes. So there I got the, I, I've got it in minutes. Now I go back to the, the cycle analysis, pick this cycle and go down to define cycle. I've already got that picked. Go to cycle limits. I've got that picked. And now notice it's minutes on the axis. I go to plunger fall, it shows minutes. And here the column in minutes, so it automatically converted it into minutes. I could change, I can change the time scale, I can change the depth scale to whatever units that I want. And I bring this graph back up here. And here's the graph. And if I click on this one, I don't I don't like that one. I think it's not correct because see, look, it's it's not it's not in this trend. It must be a, it's an outlier. So why is why is it an outlier? Why doesn't it why doesn't it match up? Well, if you look right here, the plunger went by the collar and made two, two, two noises. And it went there, it only made one. Here it made two, and it's the second one. And there's the first one. And there's the first one. So the real problem starts over here. So if I take this one and move it to right there, and that one's on the first one, that one's on the first one, and that one is on the first one. Now that little point moved back up into the body of the data. And so, you know, it, sometimes you might have to fine tune the automatic pick. These are automatically picked. Anyway, that's just an example of, of counting the collars. I've got, well, I've got the collars counted. Then I guess the next thing is do the gas properties. And I'm going to go into the data and move down to about, hold on, look. Echo, 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 and they're really close together, hard to see. So I'm going to go down to about caller 60, where they're spread farther apart. And so now I can see a double kick, and then I'm going to pick that one right there. And I got that one added. And now the acoustic velocity in this gas, this gas is about 0.82. Uh, it's a little bit less than that, but I, I can pick another one, average amount. But this is an example of round trip travel time to the depth, and that gives us the gas gravity. Once we have the gas gravity in the well, we can go into the analysis of the data. And so here's our analysis of the, of the well. We can set this to, let's say, three seconds, three second steps. And I can say, replay it. And so here's the plunger falling in a well. And here's the real time calculations changing. Here's the, the flow rates. Here is the plunger depth, plunger velocity, uh, bottom of pressures, um, liquid in the tubing, percent liquid. And then if I go to the analysis plot, there's the graphs of that same data. These are, you know, real time, not real time. These are calculated from the data that we just acquired on the well. And it shows the plunger falling down the well. And this is, this is uh, pressures. And I can, I can stop this if I want. 
and slide it to right right here and I can say okay right there the plunger is falling to the to the liquid and it's falling on average about 39 feet per 38.95 feet per minute so I think I'm about running out of time but that's a quick review of the data um, you're welcome to look at it and email us questions if you have additional questions uh, hope you enjoyed this and I'm going to let Carrie Ann wrap up Sure. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you all for joining us. And we certainly have enjoyed the questions and interactions. So if you have any follow up questions, um, please feel free to email us. You can respond to the registration email if that's easier. And we'll always welcome your phone calls and emails. The recorded video of this session will be available on our Ask Echo Meter web page and I put a link out there on chat for you guys to see that. Um, you can also download a PDF of today's presentation and then of course the data that Lynn has just gone through with the example. Next week's session will be the topic will be on static bottom hole pressures and the presenters will be Dieter Becker and Dr. Tony Podio. So if you are already on the registration list for the weekly sessions you'll all automatically get an email from me with each week's session link. If you haven't sent your email in, um, you can just leave a leave a comment here on the chat if you'd like, or go to the Ask Echo Meter webpage and there's a registration link that you can click from there. So we uh, appreciate your time today. And we're so glad that you joined us and we look forward to seeing you guys again next Wednesday. And have a great week. All right. Talk to you all later. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah.